Hey, it's Western. I just uh, got a lot of requests to actually do my uh, talk that I did on the Great Crypto Wall, which is basically making your computer Im immune to ransomware. And I'm actually going to go over uh, a little bit of the details here. So I'm Western Hacker. I've been doing pen testing for about 11 years professionally. And I do a lot of talking and lots of research on the side. Uh, some of that includes reverse engineering malware and actual uh, kits for it. So. So like I said, I'm a senior security engineer and senior pen tester. I've been doing pen testing for 11 years. I've spoken at DEF CON several times. I just spoke at uh, Black Hat this year, did some ATM hacking. I uh, spoke at Hope and Takedown Con. I actually did this talk at Takedown Con, Hope, 11, and B-Sides Boston. And I did some ATM hacking and some hotel hacking uh, for some of the other ones. So yeah, or for DEF CON this year, sorry. And uh, yeah, I've been doing reverse engineering and programming for about 12 years. Got a lot of fun side projects, including hacking cars, point of sale systems, pretty much anything that's electronic. And uh, it's actually pretty funny um, how I funded a lot of my research this year, because uh, it's not just, you know, not everybody can just go buy an ATM machine. Uh, it's something one of my buddies in a data center uh, gave me a connection on buying 180 uh, bricked hard drives. Actually, there were three terabyte hard drives. They got bricked by an ESXi instance and it was a firmware glitch. So I basically recovered them all, DOD wiped them, just to stress test them, and pretty much sold them. And that's how I funded a lot of the fun stuff I got in my hacker lab. Uh, building skimmers, shimmers, buying ATM machines. Um, yeah. I bought a lot of stuff this year. A lot of, a lot of fun things to play around with. Um, and yeah, I got a lot into gas pump skimmers. Uh, uh, made some little cheap, inexpensive devices that actually uh, stop gas pump skimmers from working. It's kind of cool. So. Here's a little bit of the research. I was playing around with some looping uh, serial traffic. I actually have a video up if you want to watch it. It's on YouTube. And uh, the device in the back there with a huge coil on top of an Arduino is uh, my load balanced version of uh, the mag spoofer, which is basically a Sammy Cam card device. Really cool. Fun research. Um, some of the gas pump skimmers and uh, other connection devices are pretty fun to look at too. And I'll be releasing lots of other videos on some of that stuff. So. And yeah, a, like I said, I made a couple uh, tools this year that actually, uh, uh, yeah, basically you can brute force maid keys, uh, other guests' hotel room keys off of weaknesses in property management software. And uh, that that video is actually up. Um, Def Con released it on, I think it was, uh, yeah, actually it was on 8.19. So feel free to go watch that. It was a pretty good talk. I had a good time doing the research. Really good turnout. And uh, ransomware. This is what the actual talk will be about. Uh, how to make your system immune to modern ransomware. And uh, it actually works on a lot of malware, just aside from ransomware. Pretty much uh, a lot of the same people are developing a lot of the malware. So uh, I'm going to go over some of the tools used. Uh, brief history of malware and ransomware. How I came across the malware. It's a pretty funny story, actually. And uh, how I pulled it apart, looked at the actual payloads and evasion methods. Uh, how to defend your system from droppers, the main payloads and in effect making your computer immune to modern ransomware and malware. So that's one of the biggest things, uh, heuristic engines, which are what antiviruses depend on to detect the fingerprints of malware. It's kind of a deprecated device for doing this, and it's kind of what led me to this research, because I kind of got sick of hearing of every other week, you know, people are getting encrypted and a lot of the ransomware and stuff like that. So, And I think they're making like $40 million a month off of uh, some of the variants of the actual ransomware. So. It's a pretty lucrative business. They're professionally funded now, and it's something that I don't see stopping unless if people actually change their methods that they're actually looking at attacking the uh, actual droppers, which are the small programs, which I'll go into detail. So, so basically, a special environment uh, that I actually had set up is uh, specifically for pulling apart malware. It's basically to trick any software that is run inside of it, and malware being included in this, uh, it makes it think it is a fully uh, functional physical box, not a virtual machine. Uh, this is something where I can still do snapshots, re uh, revert back to snapshots. I can, you know, install different tools, look at different states. I can advance time. I can do a lot of the things that I need to do to actually uh, pull malware apart or get it to actually run its payloads. And uh, so basically, I have a tackle VM, which is a VM that literally doesn't know it's a fake machine. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of the VMware tools classically installed in the places that they're naturally found. Uh, there's lots of custom software running on it. Um, it has fake user data. It makes it look like it's used. Uh, there's accounts that are logged into, there's activity and things like that, that a lot of the malware is looking for. You see if it's actually in a sandbox nowadays. So, so I tested uh, actually over 27 variants 
uh, the actual ransomware. Um, everything from SamSam to your custom tailored variants, uh, which is some of the more custom software. Uh, CryptoLocker, CryptoWall, uh, those are the big ones. Uh, variants 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, 4 on the CryptoWall. Um, the two versions of Locky that I had the ability to look at this year, and some of the Sam's Club, you know, run-of-the-mill, <laughs> smaller versions of malware also. Uh, yeah, pretty much all of them. Uh, but the crazy thing is the actual really shitty malware uh, actually does no sandbox evasion, so some of these techniques don't actually work on it, but the actual professionally programmed, like, 40-man team malware actually gets blocked by a lot of these methods that I'll be going into. So. And uh, ransomware had to evolve. So, and since it's 2016, I had to throw in a Pokemon reference. But basically, I'm going to go into why the ransomware had to evolve. Uh, next generation firewalls, it's something that as soon as people started getting hit by this, uh, a lot of the next gen firewalls um, and IDS uh, started throwing sandbox environments in. So anything that's installed on the network, it'll actually boot up a physical instance, or it'll spin up a virtual instance of a machine, and it'll pull it apart. It'll look what libraries it's calling upon, what the actual software looks like it's doing. Is it doing things that are well known for viruses? Or is it using parts of programs that are common to viruses? So that's something that the uh, virus manufacturers noticed that they needed to start evading these sandbox environments. So that's where the sandbox evasion comes in. Uh, if you look on the left, I have a couple physical machines. Uh, one's an iOS, one's a Linux device, and one's a uh, Windows device. And all three of them, you know, they get infected by the malware because they can tell it's a valid attack subject. So the virtual machines, on the other hand, uh, totally get ignored. So I was looking at uh, reasoning why the uh, uh, virtual machines are actually ignored. And that's something that uh, a lot of people put a lot of thought into uh, for actually detecting some of these. So they started looking at some of these next-gen features that are built into firewalls. And uh, one of the first ones that I actually came across, uh, I'll go into a little bit of a story of how I actually came across the malware first. So. Uh, New Year's Eve uh, would have been 2015, oh, Christmas 2015. Uh, New Year's is when I actually checked the email. So I noticed I got a, I have a crazy buddy that I met at DEF CON 18 several years ago. And uh, we started doing some honeypot projects and uh, just fell in love with malware and uh, just finding every variant we could of everything. So uh, New Year's, uh, he, I actually liked the email he sent me. And uh, yeah, <laughs> most people don't get excited when they get sent malware. That's something that is uh, specific to me and a couple of researchers. So. Uh, the first sample I got, uh, actually I acquired it from a, like a gentleman, uh, he's a German German gentleman, he's a brilliant, just brilliant programmer, uh, very good at reverse engineering, much better than I am, and uh, he's definitely uh, one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Uh, he sends me malware all the time, uh, it's pretty much we have a couple sandboxes, or not sandboxes, um, actual honeypots out there. One of them is a disposable mail service that is run on Tor, and it's a trusted uh, site for a lot of people to anonymously mail executable files, things like that. So. That's something where uh, we run this self-destructing mail service and collect as much stuff as we can. And uh, we come across a lot of custom tailored malware and executables for that matter. A lot of stolen software, um, uh, workarounds, things like that. And it's just interesting to look at some of the stuff that you can come across when people think that there's uh, nobody really watching it. So, And it's really, really cool some of the honeypots that are actually out there that uh, people will run attacks on and just collecting that way. If you have not gotten into honeypotting, I highly, highly recommend it. And it is a very cheap hobby. Uh, malware is cheaper than phishing and pretty much every other hobby you can think of. So, yeah, so uh, he actually sold me this sample uh, once Once he showed me the goods. Uh, I logged into an ISK, or, uh, uh, EVE Online account and paid him a billion ISK. So it's something I haven't played, uh, I haven't played EVE in a while, but I, a billion ISK is enough to buy a capital trip uh, for EVE players. That's a pretty big deal. So, And I uh, re uh, re recently um, also came across, uh, through the same honeypots, um, some ICS malware that was geared at... Uh, MWD, which is measured while drilling, and some of the directional drilling uh, geared specifically for oil field, uh, oil field production. So that's something where people are trying to steal data, uh, be it wildcat data, you know, for some of the wells that haven't been drilled before. And I'm actually doing a talk down in Georgia about that. So and if you guys have any questions about how to set up some of the honeypots and some of the funness that comes with that, just uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. So, And what is software as a service, aside from a buzzword that was huge like three or four years ago? Uh, you know, big data the cloud. It's one of those things that uh, uh, the actual marketplace of technology, you know, took that turn and now the actual uh, bad guys are using it. Software as a service is basically uh, you don't need to have as much technical skill to set stuff up. You literally just pay somebody to spin up an instance of something for you. And that works exactly for these ransomware campaigns. So they're basically, uh, you pay $50 in bitcoins 
and you send them a bunch of MX records or emails, and they will spearfish those people, and they'll get them to install malware. Uh, they'll actually, you know, offer technical support that's better than most vendors. <laughs> so it's just crazy, you know, for this one small package, you can launch these campaigns as a bad guy, and that's uh, one of the crazy things out there. So, so they basically have these simple, simple platforms for launching a lot of this stuff uh, instead of launching the campaigns themselves, handling it. It's something now that people can actually launch their own campaigns. Um, people are, you know, it's getting very, very rampant, and they, you know, can have a little bit of insider information. They can, you know, target specific industries. They can target enemies. There's lots of reasons that people would want to launch these kind of campaigns, aside from just collecting the ransom. So, and what is a dropper? A dropper, like I like to explain it, is kind of a snowplow that comes before the bus. Uh, the bus being the payload of the virus. Uh, the actual dropper is a very small program, usually included in a, you know. If you've ever seen an Excel file that needed to have its macros enabled, like that's most of the time a dropper. It's a very small file. It's very uh, um, compact. Um, usually they like to change the signature on it. It's very, you know, a lot of polymorphic uh, sign signature evasion and things like that. So there's lots of uh, thought that goes into actually changing the signature on that so that AV does not detect it. Because one of the things that some of the droppers do, aside from pulling the rest of the virus in, uh, they'll actually go after some of the antivirus software and some of the watchdogs that are associated, which with the actual antiviruses. So let's think of it as a small, small file. And that boss that I was talking about, uh, that's an actual payload of the malware. So what it does is, for example, this uh, ruins a perfectly good Windows 7 install. <laughs> so basically, uh, whatever the actual payload is, be it encrypting your data, deleting data, um, you know, stealing files, stealing passwords, usernames, bank accounts, that's the payload of the virus. That's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what the actual payloads are. So. It's the goal of the virus. What the reason it was written? Uh, what does ransomware look for? So it looks for uh, file files that are uh, valuable to people. You know, wedding pictures. You look at some of those file extensions. Those are the kind of things that per you know affect productivity at work, or they actually affect uh, you know wedding photos, things like that. So that's the kind of stuff that they actually parse your hard drive for, and they have uh, automated processes for checking and evaluating and rating. You know what some of these files are. Um, and which ones they should encrypt first. So that's something that, knowing this data moving forward, knowing that it's looking to kill watchdogs, it's looking to encrypt JPEGs and MP3s and things like that. So, so once you know what it's looking for and you know how it operates, um, you look at some of the advanced methods that uh, have actually been used in the programming industry. So say, for example, um, a lot of people in college, you know, they were trying to, right when virtual machines came out, um, actually a year or two after college, uh, people would, you know, install you know, a $90,000 software instead of a virtual machine and then just blow it away every 30 days. That's one of the, the first lessons that people started learning for sandbox evasion uh, and detecting it. You know, if there's a $90,000 piece, piece of software um, and people can run it in a virtual machine, it defeats the purpose of having the physical, you know, even leaving remnants because that machine's going to be blown away. So it's something where a lot of the sandbox evasion that was used in production, you know, for a lot of really, really expensive software is now being integrated professionally by programmers that are developing the malware, and um, yeah, you know, if this malware has an end-user license agreement, how am I supposed to, you know, reverse it? That would be in the law. So they're just using very advanced methods to actually protect their software. So and yeah, so I'm looking at it actually attacking the dropper. Um, I haven't seen anybody else really do that. If anybody has, uh, please comment below in the video and hit me up on Twitter because um, a lot of the other ones are just looking at the deprecated methods of um, antivirus, you know, signature detection, looking for the fingerprints. But it's, you know, as soon as glue gets on your finger, it's pretty much useless fingerprint. So, and that's kind of a, the method that I took to this. And I was actually looking at attacking the droppers. I know a lot of the watchdogs, and I give them props, uh, they'll look for a lot of files being pulled into memory. Or, you know, there's, they're thinking a little bit outside the box. And some of that stuff and all the software that I'm releasing, uh, there's going to be three programs released uh, later October. And, yeah, they're pretty much all open source, MIT license. I hope somebody rips them off and just integrates them into their environments. Um, if not, I would like to build a community behind it and keep the actual tools up. I know there's a lot of people that enjoy reversing malware, and it'd be something that, yeah, I think it'd be a really good advanced method of actually dropping or killing some of the droppers and the actual malware. So, And uh, anybody who is a uh, computer guy uh, ends up being the IT person for your entire family and everybody you know. So this is something where I want to save you guys time also. It's all open source free. It's something you can feel comfortable installing, you know, on your mom's computer, sister's computer, people at church, or whatever the situation is. So it's something where, yeah, you have your, uh, yeah, and uh, basically, I was just showing here that there is actually 
uh, heuristics engines that I scanned this dropper, uh, which is definitely malware. Um, I submitted the virus total, and about like four or five days later, uh, it started. Yeah, it's uh, actually still clear. And this is a custom dropper that I made for uh, some of the engagements that I do. But this one was, yeah, not, pretty much not detected for about four days. Uh, best case scenario I've ever seen is probably about six hours for some of the larger ones. And those ones usually in, uh, include um, vulnerabilities or exploits uh, that make them easily catchable uh, as far as the signature detection goes. So that's something where, you know, at best case, uh, most of the antivirus engines are six days behind, a couple hours at very best. So so uh, basically heuristics engines, looking at those fingerprints, is pretty much an, uh, not a good way to actually go about attacking or blocking some of the malware, especially when it is several hundred thousand machines in production. So. So software method one is Old Yeller, and it actually got its name, as I was talking about earlier, uh, Watchdogs. So one of the first things that a lot of the original malware I started looking at um, uh, over two years ago now, uh, it was actually going after the Watchdog processes. And the Watchdog process is actually, uh, antivirus watchdogs are pretty much a piece of, piece of software that run in conjunction with your antivirus software and restart it as soon as it's killed. If your antivirus is killed, it's obviously looking to infect something. So. And the actual watchdog uh, process also has watchdog processes in some cases. So these have process ID names and very common ways to actually find them. Uh, a lot of the times they're, they're spawn folders, process IDs. A lot of that information is known and it's pretty static. Um, not a lot of them, you know, randomly generate their starting information. So it's something that uh, the antivirus or the actual virus makers um, are going after the watchdogs. And that is actually what I used to our advantage. Uh, it was one of my first concepts that I had for this. It was a... Uh, uh, I don't actually know why they would want to intentionally blue screen a computer, but there is a uh, crash on control scroll. So once the control scroll key is released, uh, which you can basically uh, attach to my process ID, which is a fake watchdog, which looks like, um, actually I actually have two versions of it, but they basically look like two separate watchdog processes on a computer. And you can attach this uh, registry key setting to it. And as soon as that process is killed, uh, be it by malware or accidentally, uh, it'll actually pretty much uh, take down your whole operating system. So, and it doesn't take it down in, in a bad way. It just literally blue screens it. So, uh, so basically, um, this would be something that you'd want to install on that person in your company or your loved one who has a problem with clicking bad links and emails. And if it's something where they would reopen it and actually re-click it again, or uh, four or five, six times, as I've seen on some of the speaker phishing campaigns I've done uh, in my career, it's uh, there's some people that need a little bit extra nudging. And you can actually uh, overwrite your uh, your dump file for your crashes over to overwrite your hibernation file, so that when they try to recover the actual installation, it'll uh, pretty much require technical support. So it's not something where your network will be infected. So basically, the safest state your computer can be in in this case is actually crashed. So and yeah, and here's software method two. So Keats uh, was my cat while I was growing up, and uh, this is the sandbox simulation. This is the first. Uh, method that I went after for actually doing sandbox simulation. And I don't know where I got sandbox simulation from a cat, litter box, maybe, I, I don't know. So. <laughs> so basically what it does is it actually makes your physical machines look like virtual machines. And uh, yeah, there were several uh, simple methods that I originally did for a lot of these. Um, some of them, let's see here. Yeah, so some of them ranged from, you know, simply uh, making the, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so, so basically making the system look like it had under 2 gigs of RAM, um, installing VMware tools, or at least process IDs that looked like VMware tools, um, changing some of the way that your memory is actually registered with some of the programs. Uh, there's lots of methods to make your machine look virtualized. And I went after some of the simplest methods, like I was saying, simple um, hex editing, where you can change the amount of memory that it looks like a computer has. And as soon as you know where those actual uh, pieces of malware look for those things, it's something where you can actually change that. So. So yeah, software method two, uh, emo. So it basically emulates um, several sandboxes. I looked at a lot of the most common ones, um, and I looked at a lot of other people's research, and I uh, thank them for all the hard work they did. Um, some people get to do this for a living, and uh, they get to they find pretty much every single thing that the malware is looking for. And uh, so that I basically integrated my own research and several other people's research into actually emulating every single one of those flags that makes malware kill itself. And Basically, that's how Emo got its name. It is a soft piece of software that makes malware kill itself. So, and it looks for uh, malware and droppers. It gives them exactly what they're looking for. So, 
And uh, here's the uh, early version. Uh, this was the BB version. Um, I learned from writing uh, my tool last year in C++ that not many people will actually go and download C++ and modify it, except for their hardcore hackers. <laughs> so it's something I actually uh, decided to uh, port a lot of my code over to Visual Basic. It's what people learn in college, and a lot of sysadmins know it. And also it uh, generates um, BB scripts. So it'll actually, or not BB scripts, it'll uh, populate PowerShell scripts. Um, so yeah, uh, so basically it's going to protect uh, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, and Windows 10. Uh, if you do click the Windows XP protection button, it tells you to upgrade. <laughs> so uh, it protects against SamSam, uh, CryptoLocker, CryptoWall, Locky, and Make It Rain just pretty much throws all the flags possible out there. And uh, a lot of the registry information that it's looking for. Uh, pretty much, um, I think it was like 191 different variables that a lot of the malware looks for. So it'll look for... Um, it looks it looks like more than one sandbox environment if you make it rain. So, and a shifting file system is a really cool uh, concept I came up with uh, for as far as changing the actual file extensions. And it's something where, say for example, if you uh, want to change all your PowerPoint presentations to XYB four seven two one K, and want a easy way to change them back and to make them validly look like that by changing some of the padding information in the actual file. Because uh, it not only looks for the file extensions, it looks inside the actual files. Uh, some of the newest versions of SamSam uh, dug very deep. It prioritized some of the files based on their size, things like that. So uh, as far as the shifting file system, uh, not only does it, uh, when it shifts the file system, it also makes a backup copy and then deletes it and then references where the deleted point was. So that's something, uh, I, uh, the original concept uh, I made for this was called Purgatory because it basically made copies of your files every day and then deleted them. Um, yeah, it's pretty much the safest place. I haven't come across any malware that does DOD wiping or low-level formatting even, so it doesn't write the drive to zeros, and it does not do a three-pass or a DOD wipe or anything along those lines. So you can basically shift your file system to something internal. So say, for example, if you want to have an internal file system, so XY41 means that that is your internal Excel files. That is how all the file extensions in your organization can work, and other people can use them, and it'll automatically associate it with your Excel program or your PowerPoint presentations. If you receive anything from the outside, uh, you can also uh, run it through the process. It'll strip any macros. Um, you can have different settings for different users. I'm trying to make it very, very, very user-friendly, so I do have um, links that will actually work, so they can click the exact same. It looks like a real file. Um, it's just a reference to... Uh, the file that has been moved to a systems folder, because most of the malware will also stay out of the systems folders religiously. So it's something where uh, they'll, they're still able to click on these links, and it looks like the normal files. Uh, it's just that they will be clicking unknown file extensions, which are reassociated with the programs. And I will actually give a pretty good demonstration of it later on in the show, so it makes a little bit better understanding. So you can associate and unassociate the files. So you can attach them to their original programs with a click of a button and enter up a password. And that's actually where the seed value comes in, because all this information needs to be stored securely, so it can be recovered, and that the malware can't just hunt it down and encrypt those files. In. So, and the R, R file value is basically um, some of the information that the malware grabs to generate the random key. Uh, you can basically re repopulate this when you do a backup to a last known state. So if you back up to say six months ago, you can throw those. You can seed that same R value and then let your computer get reinfected. And it'll give you uh, one more free file to unlock on some of the ones. So this is basically a loophole uh, where you can actually put some of the R values onto the file that you're trying to recover, and you can recover it through uh, the second or third uh, generated gateway. Um, I would imagine that it would catch on to that pretty quick, but it's uh, most of the times when I've helped people pay ransomware, it's only for one or two files. It's not for an entire file system. So, And the process does take about a half an hour, so it is kind of a a bit time consuming, but uh, it's better than paying $1,600. So, and uh, some of the times you don't even know if they're going to actually unencrypt your files. So, and yeah. And uh, I also did a uh, plugin for Outlook 2007, which that one is broken now, but the 2013 and 2016 versions, uh, they work fully. And uh, if you're still using 2007 Office, I would recommend migrating away from it anyways. But it basically, uh, any incoming files, it'll actually strip the uh, macros from them. Uh, you can do that by a user-by-user -user basis. It's basically a plug-in for Outlook. Uh, so if they get an Excel file, it'll strip the macros and save it to the oldest version. Or you can literally have um, uh, just that portion of the email f uh, funded to you, or you can have it actually forwarded. So 
So you can basically just strip all the connections to that user and uh, make them validate it. Or just, you know, have some kind of reading message. You can displace your OK or click buttons. There's lots of really cool things you can do to make people slow down and actually think about what they're doing. So here's hardware method one. If you're not a fan of installing software that Weston wrote, <laughs> It's something where uh, you can actually buy one of these hacked USB devices. Uh, it's not the actual real Samsung. This is a counterfeit device. So basically, uh, this looks too good to be true, and it did two years ago when these were like $250 drives. So I got curious. I bought one of them, uh, ran it through a memory testing tool. So I basically wrote uh, 256 gigabytes of information to it. And after about 16 gigabytes, as you can see, it started copying over itself. Uh, so this obviously is a hacked table of content. I knew that something was fishy up in the get-go. So it's something, uh, now that I had that, had that device, I was thinking of you know, things I could do with it. And I noticed that on uh, some of the uh, ghost files that I was playing around with, um, which were very large, large files that were basically containers for small files, uh, that I could basically make the computer slow down when it was encrypting them. And uh, that was something that led me to believe that I could probably do this if they were fictitious files. So basically, I took this, made it a 256 or you know, 2,000 some gigabyte, uh, two terabyte drive, and then I filled it with random MP4s, PowerPoint presentations, 3DS Studio, you name it. Uh, pretty much any file extension that the malware is going after. Uh, some of the ones that prioritize it, uh, they will actually check to make sure you know they won't actually go after MP4s that were you know less than a meg or something like that. But it's yeah, if uh, the actual software. Uh, it does come with a generator, so if you have one of these hacked USB devices, you can basically fill it with random data, you can name it, uh, you can do inputs for IMDB links, stuff like that, so it looks like legitimate videos, things like that. And uh, yeah, and then also, um, most of the ones I run, I make it look like it's an Android, uh, like something you pull off an Android phone, where it'll actually name it like IMG035 and things like that. Anyways, so it looks like legitimate files, and you have uh, 200 or, you know, two terabytes full of them. So what's going to do while it's going through that, is it's actually going to go uh, and actually encrypt every single one of those files on that drive. Uh, especially if you set it as your A drive. Most people don't have um, floppy drives anymore, so it's something that is not a problem uh, to actually occupy their A drive, and most of them go incrementally. So they go from the A drive down to C drive, D drive, F drive, everything like that. And uh, about 40% uh, through, uh, not to mention that you just added, uh, you know, about eight hours before, you know, nine hours in some instances. Um, actually about 40% through the drive, it'll actually lock up the operating system. There's some kind of memory leak that is associated with a lot of the uh, actual, op op actual open libraries that they use for encrypting a lot of the software. So this one uh, worked on pretty much all of them except for Samsung, and I'm guessing eventually they're all going to make their own in, in uh, encryption software and things like that. So This one did cause a memory leak, crash the operating system. Once again, it's safe. You can use the uh, hibernation hack I was talking about earlier if you have users that would do that more than once. So. Uh, here's hardware method two. I'd like to give a shout out to whoever the random guy at B-Sides was in Boston that gave me this idea. So this is basically a Tinsy 3.0, which is a little microcontroller. These are about $20 little computers. And I use them a lot for doing human interface device attacks, which is basically emulating a keyboard. So when these are plugged into a computer, they'll think they're a keyboard, visit a web page, and affect the person with malware. So this one's basically being used for good. And uh, this is mounted as a a little five gigabyte hard drive. It's filled with the same MP4s, MP5s, things like that. Uh, you need to make sure you whitelist this mounted partition. So you mount the partition in your A drive, like I was saying, and uh, you basically fill it with some of that random data, like I was, uh, the random data as far as images, things like that, videos. And you, uh, once that's done, you whitelist it from pretty much everything that will scan it. And uh, yeah, if anything uh, goes onto that drive, uh, if there's any voltage change, It'll actually switch to a human interface device, and it'll actually sh gracefully shut the machine down. It'll basically spam the Alt F4 buttons. Um, yeah, so it'll do the equivalent of the you know shut down halt now. So yeah, and uh, this will also be coming out in October. I'm very close. I'm building this one of my Rabbit Seven coworkers, so we have a pretty good working version. And yeah, you can do the graceful shutdown, or you can uh, <laughs> you can do the crazy shutdown, which is the you know, the hard way. So. Uh, basically, you connect the Tinsy's RX to one of the pins on the network interface card on this Lantronix, uh, which is a uh, C or PCU, which is a power control unit. It's made for remotely toggling uh, computer power. So basically, once that uh, voltage is set, it will actually kill it. It'll think that a KVM uh, sent the remote kill signal to shut the computer off, not gracefully, and it works really good.
it actually uh, shuts the computer down pretty good, and uh, you have to actually power it up to boot it. So, yeah, so that's the non-graceful version. If you want to actually uh, basically have a, a trap for actual malware, so as soon as it touches that partition, and uh, yeah, as soon as it's through, almost almost done encrypting one file, it'll actually um, basically shut the actual operating system down. You can have it switch to the human interface device also. So. And yeah, anyways, back to the software. Uh, so Emo, like I was saying, that was the, I'm going to go over Emo and uh, some of the actual other functionality of it. So aside from being able to hide your backup files and uh, actually putting them in that purgatory mode, um, that also references where those purgatory points are, so you can do data recovery. Uh, you can use any third-party tool. Um, I don't actually have data recovery built into it, but there are several free tools. Um, and it does mark and notate where they are. And it does uh, do daily revisions of it, too. Uh, there's a daily bread function you can put on where it'll actually uh, make sure that your backups aren't actually getting copied over. Like I said, uh, there have, there's not any malware that I've ever seen that actually does DoD wiping and especially even low-level formatting. So you can morph your file system. Uh, the email plugins, like I was saying, they strip all the macros. Uh, That's really, really useful. Uh, switches to internal trusted file extensions, which is uh, something that I would like to see people using. And if it's something where Debbie from accounting is supposed to be sending you a file, uh, it, it better be the trusted extension, or you can tell that it's a spear fishing campaign. So. And yeah, CryptoLocker Simulator. This is not a fun game. <laughs> this is uh, something I actually made uh, for the company I worked for before Rapid7. It was a deliverable we'd kind of give out on pen tests on some of the smaller engagements. It uh, let people know they had open read-write partitions, and just let them know how bad it would affect if they actually uh, were hit with ransomware, how much the you know ransom would be, and that would take into consideration some of the language packs that were installed if it's a you know Asian language pack, and that's also something you can do with uh, emo. Uh, you can have uh, when the computer is at rest, you can have it basically uh, changing its language pack, which can actually uh, affect how much ransom you have to pay. So. Because people, like I guess they assume people with Chinese language packs or German, you know, can afford differently. So it's something that, yeah, some of the early tool uh, functionality I took into a lot of the end end product. And like I was saying, that's going to be launched in October. So, and yeah, so uh, basically the newest version of it, after I updated the GUI and added a lot of the functionality, you can actually test your IDS uh, to see if the post call homes, uh, it's, you know, basically sends some of the traffic to some of the more random. Uh, servers in Eastern Europe and other countries outside of legal and moral boundaries. And uh, search for open read rights. So that's something where you're able to see, you know, if you have open drives, if there's a Buffalo drive or some kind of drive that people don't know about, um, those things are going to be hit if they're open shares. And that'll let you know some of those things, uh, a lot of the sysadmins, they got a lot on their plates. And it's something where it'll actually go and it'll take the exact same course that uh, an actual malware does. So it's pretty much a zoo form of the malware without a payload on it. So it doesn't actually encrypt anything, it just parses it. And uh, I apologize for that plane in the background. And let's see here. So you can actually calculate your ransomware amount, and you can build that uh, R value file. Like I was saying, if you want to actually be able to do free recoveries later on, um, if it's something where you have a high, high value um, file, you can actually collect the R values on it. So, and uh, that works on pretty much uh, every one of them except for the the uh, older versions of Sam Sam and some of the custom ones uh, because they will uh, eventually, you know, catch on to that kind of stuff. So, so aside from, uh, yeah, you pull the system files at time of infection, you can downright the clock, like I was saying. Uh, and let's see, here's the actual GUI on it. So this is the graphical user interface. Uh, you can basically check, uh, like I was saying, the test uh, post, see if your IDS will catch actual columns to Russia. Print the report. Um, you can encrypt your uh, test your backup process. Uh, say, for example, if you wanted to uh, uh, encrypt files, you can actually before you run the parse, you can change it to the um, BF4 BF4 Pro. Uh, I have it actually written down. It's a file extension. And it'll actually encrypt that file. Then you can test your backup process on it, or you can unencrypt it from the actual software. So, so basically, after you enter the password and username, you can test it at you know, different levels. Say, for example, if a user account was hacked, uh, how uh, different levels, say, for example, if your backup, you no know, user was hacked, you can test it at a different level. You can check your domain for open read and write, like I was saying, open read and write. So, so it's basically a simulator that would tell you the exact effects without actually having to pay the ransomware. And uh, yeah, like I was saying, the actual 
levels you can test this software at. Uh, one of the biggest things, like I was saying, is ready, ready, uh, porting all of the VB. So it's something that uh, people can actually modify. Uh, a lot of sysadmins are people that I would like to have using it, in addition to people who just want to have a more secure environment. And uh, it does populate PowerShell scripts, so it's something, if, if you know VB or PowerShell, you're good to go. So I was saying a lot of these will, uh, with, with the exception of some of the um, Outlook plugins, um, and the actual file shifting systems, everything else is pretty much PowerShell based. You can do the simple file share extension change with uh, some of the PowerShell scripts, but I would still recommend doing the full-blown installation version. So. But yeah, here's an actual look at the Outlook plugin. As you can see, I got a bunch of ATM parts in an Excel file, and it pretty much, uh, as soon as I got it, it stripped it to the previous saved version and pulled it to my internal file structure extension. That is something that uh, the macros have been stripped on it, and it is saved to the previous version. So, and the uh, the simple version will actually just change the file extension, and then it'll reassociate. As you can see, this uh, original picture on top, it's called test picture, it used to be a JPEG. It is now my internal uh, file structure for my JPEGs, and you can have that evolve daily. You can have one internal to your network. It's uh, something that I'm trying to get it where it will actually work in the production environment because uh, yeah, changing file extensions and stuff like that it would seem like it would be something that would be counterproductive. But if it's reassociated with the original files, I see no uh, issue with it, especially for some of those users that would uh, be most likely hit with some of these files. So. And yeah, and like the bottom one of the bottom is the PowerPoint presentation. So there's a couple other file systems that were actually changed. So, and yeah, there's a couple other uh, small, really cool features. and. Uh, uh, I'm going to add those in the final build, um, but as far as uh, making your computer look like it's used less, um, that's one of the biggest things, like some of the uh, cookies and file extensions and password stealing functionality uh, that is built into some of the keystroke catching and like a lot of the other stuff that is built into other malware is something I might also take a look at uh, for as far as uh, the droppers that are specific to those. Like I was saying, a majority of them uh, use, you know, there's like 11 different droppers that went, there's way more than that, but uh, as far as the ones that I keep coming across, uh, there, there are 12 very, very uh, common ones. It's like if you're driving in traffic, you're going to see those ones if they were SCVs in Boston, for example. So, anyways, awesome. Yeah, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I always love feedback on this kind of stuff. Uh, like I was saying, that guy who, in Boston, I wish I would have got his name. <laughs> That's something, if you guys have other features, and if you've tried some of these things in the past, and you were wondering... You know how to do some of these on a small scale, how to change the RAM. Uh, if you can't wait till the actual stuff comes out, or if you want to contribute to it, yeah, feel free to hit me up. I am going to be releasing it all open source and my P license. So pretty much anybody can modify it and uh, use it for their own good. So I just want to thank you guys for watching, and I hope to see you online, and I'll see you at DEF CON next year.